these, these familiar texts, like last week's feeding of the 5,000, and this one, where Jesus walks on water to the disciples in a boat in the midst of a storm on the Sea of Galilee. These familiar texts give preachers a real challenge. You know the story. You've heard it a million times. You know what it means. Here today, for example, we remember that Jesus, after hearing about the death of John the Baptist, tried to get away for some quiet time, some silence, to grieve John's death and contemplate the path that was before him. The crowds won't give him rest, so he feeds the multitudes. And then again, he tries to find rest. He sends the crowds home and the disciples out in a boat and heads to the mountains to pray alone and in silence. But sometime between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., Jesus, aware of the distress on the sea, comes walking across the water to those disciples in that storm-tossed boat. At first they think it's a ghost and they cry out in fear. Who needs a ghost in the midst of one of the worst storms they've ever been in? But Jesus, hearing their cries, speaks those oh-so-needed words, don't be afraid, take heart, it is I. Then Peter, ever, ever impetuous Peter, says, Lord, if it's you, just command me to walk out there to you. Come, Jesus says. And Peter jumps out of the boat, starts walking toward Jesus on the water until, until he becomes aware of the wind and the waves, at which point he starts to say, Come, save me, he cries. And Jesus does. He saves Peter, and the storm subsides. And you have heard all the traditional interpretations, I'm sure. If Peter had just kept his eyes on Jesus, if Peter had not doubted, just as, if Peter, just as Jesus saved Peter from distress and calm the storm, he can do the same thing for us. You've heard those sermons, and all those interpretations are true. But I need to tell you, for some reason, the resources I use every week for sermon study and preparation seem to be pushing me to think outside those traditional interpretations to other possibilities, to other challenges behind these scriptures, to deeper meanings beyond what I've always been taught. Last week, you remember, David Lowe's challenged us to think that the real miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 was not the miraculous multiplication of the bread and fish, and not even that spiritual connection to that final banquet that awaits us in heaven on the last day. But rather, he said the real miracle is Jesus himself who embodies God's call to feed the hungry and uses, in spite of their attitude, those 12 disciples to feed the hungry. And your challenge was to do the same. So today, as you place your loaves and fishes in the offering plate, along with your money, we will receive and bless your gifts of compassion. I'm thinking about what I'm writing. Well, that was last week's insight, new insight. And this week, as I studied for this sermon, I came across a couple of different ideas as well. First, I read this. Most sermons draw attention to Peter's attempted stroll out on the turbid waters, and we try to analyze why Peter sank. Lack of faith in God. Did he take his eyes off Jesus? Insufficient trust. Did he succumb to the fear of the windstorm? This author writes, we don't know which of any of those interpretations are correct, but we do know one thing for certain. Peter sank because he left the boat. <laughs> if he had stayed in the boat with his fellow disciples, he would not have sunk. That comes from a resource called Sundays and Seasons. And then in another resource titled New Proclamation, I found these words. Peter left the boat to get closer to Jesus. A fine sentiment, but not a terribly bright idea, especially for a professional fisherman. Well, I, I will confess, I had never looked at Peter's actions this way. So I got to wondering, what's the gospel message there? 
if, if, if you think about this story from that perspective, how does that shape what we know of Jesus, of a boat in troubled waters, of Peter, of the other disciples in that boat? So here are my thoughts, maybe a little disjointed, I, don't, I hope not. First of all, Jesus. There's a rather powerful identif identification of Jesus in Matthew's Gospel that our Western ears often miss. When Jesus says to the frightened disciples, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid, the it is I actually is I am. The words that God spoke to Moses from the burning bush, I am, I am the God of your father uh, Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. That I am name of God for the Hebrew nation was so sacred and so holy that no one dared speak it. Instead, they left out some vowels and consonants and came up with the name Yahweh. They never spoke the I am. And here, on that water, Jesus claims God's name. I am as his own. The disciples, all devout Jews, would know that and bow in fear and truly not before the storm, but before the Lord God Almighty. Then there's Peter. When you think about it, even today we know that you don't leave the boat. Stay with it. Wait for help to come. Surely he and the others who were professional fishermen in that day knew this even way back then. And yet there was something overwhelmingly powerful about the presence of the living God that calls Peter to act, maybe foolishly, and surely impetuously. But he got out of the boat. He walks a little distance on the water, and then he starts to sink. And then look what Jesus does. He leads Peter back to the boat. You can almost see Jesus shaking his head, maybe even with a smile on his face or a twinkle in his eye. Oh, you of little faith. And then the wind ceases. And that same sound of sheer silence that Elijah experienced on the mountainside in the presence of God now is there on that sea of Galilee. And for the first time in their life together as the chosen twelve, the disciples worship the Son of God. And of course, in the New Testament scriptures, the boat is always a symbol for the church. And the storm, the world of chaos, into which disciples are sent to proclaim the good news. That's what Paul is talking about in his letter to the church in Rome. How are they to call on one whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim them unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. And that doesn't just mean ordained pastors. It means you, all of you, because you are a part of the priesthood of all believers. So here's what I'm thinking the meaning of this gospel text to us 21st century Christians might be. Maybe this is not an either or lesson. Either we get out of the boat and do kingdom work, or we stay safely in the boat, in our pews on Sundays, now and again, and count ourselves among the righteous, the good people of God. Maybe it's not an either or. Maybe it's both. Jesus, you remember, led Peter back to the boat, back where the other disciples were. And they worshipped. Worshipped him as the Son of God. So worship is where we start in the boat. Worship is a community in a community of faith. Regular worship in a community of faith is essential if we are going to be fed and prepared to go out into the world. I often heard Leonard Bowick, Bishop of the North Carolina say, uh, Senate say, worship is the most important thing we do on this earth. Worship is the most important thing we do on this earth. I believe he's right. Worship 
regular worship is where we are fed and sent out. But then, then we are sent out. Then we do get out of the boat. We leave this boat. We leave this sanctuary. We take the risk. We proclaim the good news in inviting ways to all who will hear. We feed the hungry. We pray the naked. We comfort the suffering and dying. We hug someone who needs a hug. We wipe a tear from the eyes of a crying woman. We invite. We invite others to come. To come and worship. To come and hear the good news. To come and be welcomed into this boat, into this community of faith, and then join with us in going out and inviting others. But it seems to me that we really can't get out of the boat if we're not in it in the first place. And if we're in it and really hear the gospel proclaimed, then we can't help but get out of the boat and take the risk of walking on water. I don't know. Maybe you should give that some thought this week. Amen.